on behalf of the entire mindre india i oshani banerji from mindre india ultrasound team welcome you all to the webinar on ultrasound evaluation of peripheral nerves pathology let me welcome our speakers of the evening dr upasna mishra barua head of ultrasound and conventional radiology at excel care hospital guwahati assam she is a member of iria ifu mb and society of fetal medicine she has a member of publications uh, she uh, she has a number of publications in the field of endo radiology she is also coordinator of various national level workshops she is the faculty in iria endocrine society of india indian rheumatology association and musculoskeletal ultrasound society her special area of interest is in fetal medicine and musculoskeletal usg let me also welcome our guest speaker dr ankit shah consultant radiologist at kls memorial hospital mumbai he is a member of iria ifu mb society of fetal medicine musculoskeletal ultrasound society and association of medical consultants he has a number of publications in the field of msk and its pathologies i would like to thank both of you for joining us now before starting the actual session i need few minutes of your time to brief you all on our premium transducer technology which is relevant to the session first 3t transducer technology 3t transducer technology is mind rest unique transducer technology available in all the mind rest transducers where the first t denotes triple matching layer for higher sensitivity wider bandwidth and improved signal to noise ratio second t denotes total cut design for lower crosstalk better directivity and improved lateral resolution third t denotes thermal control design for better acoustic transmission and higher signal to noise ratio second is our combo wave technology in which the traditional elements are innovated in a new type of composite piezoelectric materials for better acoustic spectrum and lower acoustic impedance to provide high performance imaging third we have all in one transducer for needle guided procedure in which the transducer l12-3 vns is having three user defined programmable buttons which act as remote control to ensure simple safe and convenient needle guidance imaging without touching the system that's it from my side at mindry we believe in better healthcare for all thank you for your time now i humbly request dr upasna to take the lead over to you ma'am thank you so much i'm sharing my screen yes ma'am so at the very beginning i want to thank mandri for giving me the opportunity and i want to thank dr onkit for uh, for accepting my invitation as a guest speaker so now i am going to say about ultrasound evaluation of peripheral nerve pathologies i think it is the most unexplored field of ultrasound so my objective will be normal nerve zone anatomy nerve pathologies including common nerve entrapment site nerve traumas and its severity and importance of scanning the adjacent non neural structures so as we all know the linear array high frequency transducers are the transducer of choice because it has a linear uh, surface wh where the piezoelectric crystals are arranged in a linear fashion so when you have all the sound will go back to the transducer it will go back and directly hit the transducer surface so there is less chance of losing data this high resolution sound wave they fade they do not penetrate deep into the body but they give excellent images of the superficial structures and they make them the source of transducer for this kind of ultrasound and we have a we have a wide range of excellent uh, 
uh, linear transducer in the market available and we can choose according to our need. So before going to pathology, I think we should go a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of the nerve tissues so that we can understand the pathology much better. So the neuron is the functional unit. It has a uh, specialized part that is called the body or soma. The body has few hairline, stru hairline structures around it, which are called dendrite, and it has a very specialized elongated structure, which is called axon, and it ramifies ending into the axon terminals. These axon terminals uh, produce synopsis with the uh, dendrite of the next neuron. So the function of the axon is to transmit the electrochemical signal or the axon potential through it to the next neuron. Let's go through the structure of the axon. So this, this represents an individual nerve fiber. So in cross-section, here is the axon, <clears throat> and it is covered with a thin layer of fluid, which is called endoneural fluid. And outside here, it has two layers of its own nerve seeds. The outer layer is the neurilima, that is the plasma membrane of the Schwann cells that help to protect the nerve fiber and help in remodeling of the nerve fiber whenever there is injury or something. This neurilima, it will secrete cholesterol, protein, and lipids, which form the myelin seed. And we all know about myelin seed. And this myelin seed, along with the fluid, they form the insulating cover of the axon. And don't, they don't permit the harmful molecule of the blood uh, to come across to the action. They also don't allow the electromagnetic signal to pass across and into the action or some um, neuron, some molecules like sodium. So just look at this. This is not continuous. There are some interruption. These are some very small microscopic gap there. These are called nodes, nodes of Ranbir, which are very rich in sodium gas channels. So whenever a signal pass through the action, it has to jump from one node to the other node. And <clears throat> this type of conduction is called saltatory conduction. So myelin seed not only protect the nerve fiber, but it will uh, increase the propagation of the signal across the action and jump in the jumping way. This signal come here in the synopsis and they stimulate the neurotransmitter, which will transmit the signal to the next neuron. So in any diseases where we will be losing our myelin seed, and then the signal will uh, flow in a current loop along the action, then it becomes very slower and it gets attenuated. For example, so we can see here, this is the outside myelin seed. So the signal is passing and it becomes attenuated and slow. But in comparison, this is a normal fiber. We can see how fast a signal is moving there, and it gives about 120 meter per second. So this way, all about a single nerve fiber. So a single nerve fiber, um, there are many nerve fiber in a nerve. So in that actions are grouped together, forming one physical, and it has its own cover called perineurium. And many physicals together, they form a nerve, and it has its one outer cover, which is called epineurium. You know, now is uh, incredibly blood thirsty and it consumes about 20% of the entire body oxygen supply, while it constitutes only 2% of the total body weight. So it has a rich capillary network there in the endoneurium and um, epineurium, perineurium and his, uh, has its own nerve supply. But mind it that nerves do not have a lymphatic channel. So this is the structure of the nerve here. And this is the way how they form a complete pathway for the passage of the across the body. So let's move to the sonoanatomy. So in long section, it has a typical physical pattern where you can see, and it is termed as a bundle of straw. Here, there are some linear hyperbaric structures that represent the fascicles, and the outer ecosonic layers, it represents the connective tissue layers. So it is a very nice pattern, and we can see it high resolution, with high resolution ultrasound very nicely. And in cross-section, our nerve will give 
a horny competitor with hypoechoic dots representing the fascicle and the echogenic layers representing the connective tissue. But at the beginning of our scanning, we should know a little bit about anisotrophy because it has a very notorious effect in MSK ultrasound. The thing is simple because uh, when we keep our probe parallel to the structure we are imaging, then all the images, all the sound wave that we will send to the structure will get reflected back and hit the uh, transducer and there will be no loss of data and we will have a very clear, nice image of the underlying structure. But whenever there is oblique orientation between the probe or the structure, because we know this structure moves obliquely, they have uh, repeated moments go up, down, side to side. So there will there is every possibility it gets an oblique orientation with the probe. So some of the sound if will be angulated back and go away from the probe and we will be losing data. And this lost data will be represented as some hypoechoic area of the structure on our ultrasound monitor that can confuse us, us for some pathology. There are two types of nerve fibers. They may be cable type, where the fascicles land parallel to each other and it gives a typical fascicular pattern that are commonly found in the peripheral now and the plexiform pattern where the phrases goes to splitting, branching, and rejoining along its course, like in the central places like brickel plexus. So in these fibers, there is already an internal obliquity of the nerve fibers giving rise to anisotropy. And these nerve fibers, normally we can have a hyperquake pattern instead of a fascicular pattern that we should be aware of. So things we have to remember that at branching the physical device, the size of the from proximal to distal with branching. Now vascularity normally is not picked up by ultrasound and now is compressible. Clinical point to remember is that the pain is a sign of irritation. Whenever there is irritation of trauma, irritation or trauma, there is increase in the endoneural fluid as we have described in the cross-sectional anatomy of the axon and it causes pain. And tingling or pain or needle sensation is a very good sign because it indicates the presence of a new action in the process of growing. That means the nerve is fighting to regenerate or to remodel, remodel itself. Tinnel sign is very important in a clinical sign that will uh, always lead us to the diagnosis. It is that whenever we tap over a pathological nerve, then it will uh, cause paresthesia over the area of nerve distribution. And so it will lead us to the uh, nerve which is pathologically involved. So how to scan it now? Let's move to the ultrasound room. And we usually, our approach would be a uh, landmark basis on the landmark. So we will identify a nerve in a well-known landmark, like here I am identifying a median nerve at the carpal tunnel. Then we will uh, scan the nerve in a transverse mode in a short axis between the muscles is going in the intramuscular fasciae. And whenever we finish our study or we find something pathological, we can turn our probes 90 degree to the long axis of the nerve and follow the nerve, scan it, and the peri perineural areas Ma also to find the, the pathology. Ma'am, your voice is cracking. Uh, can you try to switch off your video? Okay, it's not seen here. Okay. Where it is? Okay, yeah. stop video. Yeah. yeah. Right. Shamta, can you do that from your side? Okay. Yeah. Done. Uh, the stop yeah. video? Done. Yes, yes. Done. Please, ma'am, carry on. Okay, this is called elevator technique. Sometimes the differentiation from other structures may be difficult because of anisotropy, then nerve give a very hypoechoic appearance. But the, uh, its solution is simple. You just put on your color button and see the color filling of the vessels. In fact, the arteries, they give a uh, important landmark for identification of the nerves like spicule artery in the median nerve or maybe the posterior circumflex artery of the radial nerve or the ulnar nerve for the ulnar artery like that. Uh, a tendon 
is really they lie close to the uh, to a joint and a tendon always shows a very compact it is increased uh, the echogenicity and it shows a free mobi mobility with the movement uh, unlike in nerve tissue and <clears throat> nerve is really moves between the muscles and muscle has a typical pinnate appearance here and it is easily identifiable from the nerve and on the cross section muscle shows a typical starry sky pattern and you can identify the nerve lying with a typical honeycomb pattern there so going to the nerve pathologies so let's first start with the nerve tumor it constitute about 5% of all extremity tumor and the benign neural tumors are neurofibroma, schwannoma, traumatic neuro, uh, neuromas, then motor neuroma, lipofibromatous hematoma, and intraneural ganglioma. So the most common nerve tumor that we usually find uh, found is the neurofibroma or schwannoma. So whenever we diagnose a nerve sick tumor, the first question arises either from the clinician side or in our mind also, whether it is a neurofibroma or a schwannoma, because you know its uh, origin, its prognosis and treatment, everything is different. So for example, in neurofibroma, we know it arises from the perineural fibrosis. So this is intimately related with the nerve fibers. It is insulating between the nerve fibers, so the surgeon has to excise the tumor and do an end to end anastomosis. On the other hand, we know schwannoma is arises from the Schwann cells of the neuroma, if you remember the structure of the nerve action. So it is encapsulated, it is peripherally located, so surgeon can easily remove it with intracapsular inoculation without disturbing the nerve fiber. So there are many studies are going on to find out the key features of the tumor and to differentiate from it from each other. For example, J.A. Ryo, they did a study of 146 pathologically proven nerve tumor, and they decide some uh, predictors to differentiate between these two. And they have shown that if we use all the predictor, our accuracy rate comes to around 83.6%. This shows that shape and contour is round or lobulated in schwannoma and fusiform in neurofibroma. Then maximum to minimum ratio is one to four in schwannoma. And more than four is highly specific for neurofibroma. It is eccentrically located. Neuro, um, schwannoma is 43% heterogeneous and it can show cystic change and calcification and also higher vascularity of grade two to three. On the other hand, neurofibroma is centrally in location, 15% heterogeneous. It is normally hypovascular and it is not well encapsulated. It has an infiltrative nature. So it, is, it has a long transitional zone. On the other hand, here the transitional zone is well defined and it is encapsulated. Malignant change is rare in schwannoma but it can happen in neurofibroma. They also have grading of the vascularity. Like grade one is one to four dots of signal. Grade two is two linear color signal or more than five dots. Grade three is more or equal to three linear color signals. So what is the harm if we, um, if we, if we try to find out the type of the uh, tumor or what it is? For example, here is a typical neurofibroma. It shows a central in a entry of the nerve into the mass, and it's going out with a long transitional zone, which, uh, which cannot, uh, we cannot find out a well-defined border of the mass. On the other hand, schwannoma is well encapsulated, cystic change, and shows high vascularity. This is a neurofibroma of C7 nerve root, or it's a neurofibroma or the median nerve. We can see the central entry of the mass to the uh, nerve to the mass with central localization. So this is a young man with a mobile mass on the literal part of the thumb, uh, thigh uh, in the subcutaneous plan. And it shows a side-to-side -side movement in positive tunnel sign. Mind it, I am saying it shows side to side moment. A nerve tumor always show a side to side moment and it usually do not exhibit a uh, uh, phallocotyl moment along the axis of the nerve. So it shows vascularity, it's oval, it shows cystic change and the nerve we can see located peripherally. So obviously we will think about schwannoma and histologically it is proved. This patient with allodynia, it's Allodynia means if you touch a patient, he has extremely high sensation. He almost he did not allow us to touch this mass, but he was able to find a schwannoma of the uh, peripheral, paraspinal nerve. You can see a nerve eccentrically passing 
uh, along the mass and going out at the R drive. This is a very interesting case. The patient has a swelling on the medial aspect of the uh, foot and he has uh, no pain, no sensation, no paresthesia. But he says it was there before, but now he came for, uh, he has um, disability to wear shoes or anything and the, because of discomfort, uh, he came. So we, on ultrasound, we can see a large lobulated mass here that is playing the first metatarsal and it is located on the medial side of the foot. It is well circumscribed, it is highly vascular, but we cannot, we could not find out where from it has been arised. In surgery also, they removed the mass which was typically similar uh, structure like the ultrasound, but they also failed to find out where from it arises. So we have to wait for the uh, histopathology. It shows the swanoma. So what to do? Next we will go back to the ultrasound room. I show all the images there and trying to find out the nerve. And ultimately I can see a small nerve coming into it from one corner of the mass. A swanoma with a small cutaneous nerve in continuity, it's barely visible here. And this a young man, he came with swelling, pain, motor deficit and sensation. Uh, and the swelling is on the hypotenar eminence, it shows color change. And we can see a very irregular hyperbaric mass lying in the Gans tunnel. And if you notice the mass is extending medially, infiltrating into the flexor retinaculum with the carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, this is the median nerve showing very restricted movement there. In longitudinal image, we can see it's infiltrating into the hypotenar muscles and extending to the head of the fifth and fourth metacarpal. But seeing the uh, changes in the ulnar nerve, we can see the nerve changes here and it is in continuity of, with the mass. And I feel somehow it is arising from the ulnar nerve. And the mass also causes stenosis and ablation of the ulnar artery here. So I gave the possibility of malignant peripheral nerve sick tumor and histology proved the same. It's a very rare tumor and incidence is about 0.001% and typically it's more than five centimeter in diameter and it's very locally aggressive tumor and infiltrating into the adjacent structure with motor weakness and sensory deficit. <clears throat> so the next popular neuroma we have is the motor neuroma. We all know that it is related to microtrauma of a digital nerve. Uh, digital nerve passes between the two metatarsals and uh, it, it also passes between the superficial and deep intermetatarsal ligament, which uh, we have also here on metatarsal passa. So it is prone to friction injury, especially when the person used to wear a tight shoes or a high heel. And it typically usually occur between the third and fourth metatarsals in, in this space, because we know this, this uh, interdigital nerve is bigger in size in comparison to the other because it is formed by union of two branches, one from the median plantar nerve and one for the lateral plantar nerve. So whenever there is friction, so there will be extrinsic concentric proliferation of the fibroblast and swan cell with loss of mild fiber, and it gives rise to typical pain, a very shooting pain. It has spread to the um, toes when it gains a large size, typically it, if it is more than five centimeters in size. So the differential diagnosis here is the metatarsal parcel that we can prove with a sonographic molder sign. Here we can scan from any side, and on the other side, we are clasping the metatarsal head and exerting pressure on the suspected area. This will elicit pain and with a palpable click caused by the tumor escaping to the opposite surface of the metatarsal head. So also the metatarsal basa is compressive and a tumor is not compressive. So in my case, we can see the motor neuroma between the first and second metatarsal in the first wave space instead of it should be commonly present here. So we have the positive uh, taste here. It, now uh, this tumor, popping out of the metatarsal head and source little vascularity. Lipofibromatous hematoma is rare tumor, which was first described by Mashon in 1956. And here, Dr. Ankit has uh, demonstrated it very nicely. You can see a uh, nerve here, 
an area a hyper echoic nodular lesion in the nerve with loss of the fascicular pattern. And in cross section, we can see the fascicles are widely separated by hyperechoic areas. These are due to infiltration of the fibroadipose tissue between the epineurium and perineurium. And it is hypovascular in nature. So stump neuroma is another cause of uh, tumor. It's actually, it is a tumor-like thickening. So whenever a nerve is severed, and the, the um, ends are distracted. There is always a tendency of the curtain to regrow and rejoin the nerve that got separated. So, but if the gap is considerably large, they fails to do so. But in the effort of establishing a link, there will be benign non-neoplastic overgrowth of the mass fiber, fibroblast, and Schwann cell. Ultimately, they form a tangled mass of nerve fibers uh, at the end and it is usually happen post-traumatic and post-amputation cases. And patient present with a sharp electric burning type of pain, which is the typical neurotic pain over the stump neuroma. Here you can see a stump neuroma of the uh, median tongue that lived untreated after accidental, uh, accidental rupture of the median nerve. Another case here. So this case, just it is a small uh, small boy. He's a student. He came and insisted that I should do uh, insisted me to do an ultrasound here. He says he's a small. He has a small cut injury there, and now it's completely healed. There is no um, no sign of cut injury except a small uh, scar there, and but he said that he has sharp pain there every time it rubs against the. Mm, against uh, his shoes and he pointed out a small area there. So I don't know, I didn't know what I will get, but I put the proof and I was very excited to find out this stump neuroma of a small cutaneous bounce of the saphenous nerve there, just proximal to the cut injury. So this is a young lady. She came with a swelling and pain at the distal end of the index finger. She said she had some operation for the nail pathology, but she could not exactly show or say, tell us what was it. So on scanning, we can find a glomus tumor uh, in, on the medial side of the na uh, nail, and it's possibly the same tumor she was operated for. But in addition, we could find out a stump neuroma of a proper digital nerve at the level of the DIP joint. So it's not impossible to find out smaller and smaller pathology if we give more time and do it dedicatedly and we have a good transfusion to do it. So intraneural ganglion cyst is another tumor. It's a cystic lesion uh, which is lined with fibrous well, containing mucinous cyst and it's seen within the epineurium of a nerve. It grows and migrates along the nerve. So there are two theories. The spinner at all, they introduce the articular or synovial theory. They said whenever there is a dis, uh, there is a gap or um, in the synovial gap in the capsule, then the synovial fluid will uh, dissect out through it, and it will find a small articular nerve uh, close to it and propagate. It will migrate along the low resistance pathway of the perineurium and to the parents nerve. Another the theory is that it is a degenerative process of mixed degeneration of the epineurium, interneural hemorrhage, or from the embryonic remnant of the ectopic synovium. Typically, we have it commonly in the common perineal nerve regions, and it is graded. It, it is a small articular branch here from the deep perineal nerve. It's going into the uh, diviofemoral joint. When it access to the nerve, it is grade one. It reaches the deep perineal branch is grade two. Common perineal now is grade three. And when it gains access to the cytic now or descending down the tubule now, then it is grade four. So here, again, I borrowed it from Ankit and he shows a very nicely demonstrated a cystic lesion with septitions along the common perineal now. It's uh, grade three. It will be grade three disease. And in cross-section, we can see the um, ganglion cell is separate with, with replace the uh, axons towards one side. Even in long section, if you see carefully, you can see the nerve fiber passing along the side of the ganglion cyst. So we prefer to dissect the articular plants here instead of doing the intraneural uh, ganglion dissection, which may be more harmful for the patient. 
Next, we'll move for the compressive compression neuropathy. As you know, the nerve passes through different fibrosis and fibromuscular tunnels in the body, which help to hold them inside, in their own side without displacement. But while doing so, they may get compressed in different side. So we'll discuss about the sonographical phases in my subsequent slide. But what is the uh, pathology? Why there is compression neuropathy happening? So when, uh, whenever there is compression, there is increased permeability of the endoneural blood vessels. So there will be increase of the endoneural fluid that lead to increased uh, pressure within the, uh, within the nerve. Ultimately, it causes obstruction to the vascular supply and there will be ischemic nerve fibrous injury. And if it stays like that, if it goes to the chronic stage, there will be still external de degeneration and fibrosis and there will be nerve thickening with remyelination. So the most common compression neuropathy is carpal tunnel syndrome. While it passes through the carpal tunnel in the wrist joint, it's a narrow tunnel and it has more, many tendons there. It is prone to have uh, different uh, anatomical variations and different disease. It's a highly moved joint. So it's prone to have uh, compression there. So whenever there is a compression, the now proximal to it is thick and eight meters hypoechoic and it shows vascular signal. It may show increased vesicular pattern, thickening of the vesicles, so it may show um, diffuse edema and indistinct vesicular pattern there. So the site of compression is very nicely depicted as the north sign. It shows stepping of the nerve at this point. That may be a sharp, small one, or it may be a long one, or it may be a much longer one as we have seen here. So there are many parameters to detect a carpal tunnel syndrome. And mind it, we have to include the outer connective seat layer along the measurement to measure it accurately. And we used to measure it at the level of the distal carpal tunnel, uh, distal crease of the uh, palm, and that is uh, corresponding to the uh, carpal tunnel inlet. And if it is less than nine, we usually take it's a normal. If it is 10 to 12, it is diagnostic. If it is more than 14, that is, it is highly specific about 95%. And if it is more than 15, then it is uh, considered as a significant and needs surgical intervention. intervention. But never forget, never forget to compare with the normal opposite side and to compare with the nerve conduction study to give a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. Other parameters are cross-sectional area we measure at the distal form at the level of the pronator quadrator. Suppose this measurement is A and in and the pro inlet that is B, then if the B minus A is equal to or more than two, then it is said to be diagnostic. And if the distal flattening ratio at the distal carpal tunnel level is three or more, or the flexor retinaculum elevation at distal carpal tunnel uh, level is more than four, then it is diagnostic of carpal tunnel syndrome. So another very important uh, test we can do is the dynamic study. We ask the patient to flex and extend his finger and do the pronation supination movement. We can see there is free movement of the nerve within the carpal tunnel, and it usually shows movement towards the ulnar side, which is called transverse ulnar translation of the um, median nerve. But this is a disease case. We can see there is very restricted movement of the nerve in comparison to the tendons. It's almost not moving at all during the dynamic study. So grading of the perineural addition uh, could be done depending on the restricted transverse ulnar movement of the median nerve in comparison to the nerves this flexor, this drum superficially stand on, and a lot of studies are going on over that. Another very useful, uh, useful uh, dynamics test was explained, that is flexion, pinching, and extension on pronation moment like this. So whenever we do this, whenever we flex our, flex our hand, this is the median nerve, we, it will drop into a groove between the flexor pollicis longer and flexor digitum tendons. And when we do the extension moment, it will smoothly going up away from the roof to the superficial post. If the median nerve fails to do so, it means there is significant impingement of the median nerve. 
but not necessarily. We always have a uh, dilated nerve just proximal to the carpal tunnel. Sometimes we have a median nerve dilated distension distal to the carpal tunnel for unknown reason with a distal nerve sign that is visible at the level of the distal carpal tunnel, distal flexor retinaculum level. Here we can see the nerve is coming. It is the normal in the proximal carpal tunnel. It's going inside the carpal tunnel. It's flattened. Then it will come out and it is swelling there. And this swelling is extending into its branches, as we can see here. So these are the in, example of distal inverted nerve sign and the distal is, but, it, no, but even we can have a, a distension of the nerve proximal to the carpal tunnel and tapering at the level of the long tapering at the level of the carpal tunnel level. Again, it's swollen up at the distal end. So our aim is to study the medial nerve with an extended study. We have to do an extended study throughout the medial nerve up to its branches across the carpal tunnel level to diagnose a case of carpal tunnel syndrome. If it is chronic, then the nerve changes are a bit different. There will be more heterogeneity, physical pattern will be lost. And if it is more than 12 months, usually we don't have vascularity there and it is a bad prognostic sign. And there will be muscle atrophy as we can see here in the hypotenor muscle atrophy of the muscle and it will lead ultimately to F hand with adduction of the uh, thumb. We can have bifid median nerve in 8.6% uh, 8 of normal population. And uh, associated with it, usually we have uh, persistent median artery, which should be replaced by eight weeks of intrauterine life. It's coming from the ulnar artery. But whenever it present in 50% cases, it may be enclosed with the uh, epineurium of the, um, of the median nerve. So it is lying within the nerve seat and between the nerve. So we should document it and report it to the clinician because it is prone to injury during endoscopic uh, removal of our carpal tunnel release procedure. Here, the parameters are a little bit different with some of the uh, measurement, area measurement at the level of frontal quadratus and as well as at the level of the uh, carpal tunnel inlet. So if this is more than 19, carpal tunnel uh, level, it is more than 19 when it's sum up, it is uh, diagnostic. And if the difference between these two is more than or equal to four square millimeter, then it is diagnosed. Here is post-operative case of carpal tunnel syndrome. He has burn injury there. After operation, it develops fibrosis around the nerve on the medial, medial side of the uh, medial branch of the bifid nerve. And it shows uh, a formation of a fibroma. We can see the nerve is coming here. It got bifurcated, and we can see this uh, nerve is getting enlarged, hypoechoic, and it forming a neuroma there. A case of compartmental syndrome with all signs positive for ulnar and median nerve compression. We can see the nerve, the long segment of median nerve is get compressed in the forearm level. <clears throat> Next nerve to be um, get compressed is the cubital, uh, ulnar nerve at the cubital tunnel syndrome. We know it's passing through a narrow, uh, narrow uh, tunnel through the median. Um, by the side, we have the median epicondyle and the olecranon process, and it is covered by the osborne retinaculum here. Then it enters the true tunnel, which is between the flexor copy ulnaris two heads, which is uh, covered by the upgrade ligament. So here it is prone to get injury with microtrauma and, uh, and, and other shock trauma also. And KV and Sang at all, they give a cutoff value of 19 square millimeter. But I personally, I believe the best way is to, is to correlate clinically and, and compare with the other side if the other side is normal. Here you can see a thick ulna nerve passing across the cubital tunnel. And it's taken here. and. The, at the level of the true tunnel, now it's getting normal. <clears throat> Sometimes we may have an accessory anconeous and epitrochlearis muscle layer joining the olecranon process to the medial epicondyle, and it replaces the osborne uh, retinaculum layer. But mind it, a muscle will never cause compression unless it is hypertrophic because it is a, it is a softer structure than a ligament. Here you can see the muscle overlaying the teeth. Alana. 
<clears throat> this site is also prone for injury and, and it may get compressed by the thick talus fibrous curve formation here. It's already subluxed and shows the sign of alana compression. This is a case of cut injury and after a few days, he, they develop sign of a line of compression. And you can see the scar is just it's invading and encasing the nerve. You can see nicely, this is the scar tissue coming and tethering of the nerve and encasing it. It's surgically, you can see here the scar tissue. It's covering the nerve there. It is released and patient got improved. <clears throat> In the GANS channel, we may have accessory adductor digital minimum muscle compressing the ulnar nerve. <clears throat> Here we can see the muscle overlaying the gyan's tunnel. Normally, we should not have any muscle overlaying there except the palmar transverse fascia, and it causes compression of the ulnar nerve there. Then coming to the radial now, it has a tendency to uh, in, get injured at the back of the arm while crossing across the radial tunnel. So whenever there is fracture of the distal third of the humerus, then there will be compression and injury to the nerve. Here the, we can see nicely the proximal part of the distal, uh, distal shaft is posteriorly, going posteriorly. And in this section, we can see it's lying very close to the ulna nerve, uh, radial nerve here. And you can see it's compressing the radial nerve, which of course there is distal thickening of the radial nerve from that point. This is another in case of radial nerve compression. We can see as it approaches the bone, it, it is getting thicker uh, because of compression. And as it's going away from the radial nerve, it's gaining its normal caliber. We can see the radial nerve enlargement there. Then entering in the elbow in front of the lateral epicondyle, the radial nerve divides into the superficial uh, radial nerve and the deep um, sensor, deep motor bronze that continues between the two heads of supinator as the posterior interstitial nerve. So here, while it passing between the two heads of supinator, it has to pass through a uh, ligament, uh, arcade of ligament, which is, which is known as the uh, arcade of frost or ligament of frost. There it can get compressed. Here we can see nicely, this is the ligament of frost and it's coming and imprinting into the uh, common perineal now with distal distension of the posterior interstitial. Oh, it's sorry, it's a posterior interstitial now, showing the proximal uh, distension of the nerve. And ask the patient to do supination movement, then we can um, show it very nicely and with much aggravated uh, signs of nerve compression. In cross section, we are seeing its thickened proximal part and it's gaining its normal caliber as it passes between the two heads of supinator. And you can see a artery crossing over it. This is the recurrent radial artery. That may be another potential source of compression of radial now at this level. Here is a surgical plate impinging into the radial now. You can see here and causing the um, compression syndrome and it's surgically removed. In the leg, we have medialgia paris jessica because of uh, compression of the literal femoral cutaneous nerve and patient have sensory loss on the literal part of the thigh and we can compare the both sides. Um, we can see the normal nerve and the thicken nerve here. Here is a nice case of uh, literal femoral cutaneous nerve compression showing a very thicken nerve as it passing between the two leaves of the um, in inguinal uh, ligament, inguinal canal, and crossing across the anterior superior leg spine. This patient has severe pain, like sciatica syndrome, and he has done everything. His CT uh, MRI of spine, the spine was done and it was reported as normal. See, he was sent for a Doppler study. The patient said that he has some uh, feeling that there is fullness of his thigh at the backside. So while scanning, we find a large lipoma, which is intramuscular and compressing the sciatic nerve here. And this mass is removed and patient was improved after that. Another nerve to get compressed is the common perineal nerve at the fibular tunnel while it crossing across the fibular neck under the aponeurosis of palmaris longus. And we can see a thick nerve there. And again, there are different parameters um, they are given, like ZYKM says it's, it is more than 11.7 square millimeter, it has 75% sensitivity and 96.7% of specificity. But again, I consider uh, co correlation with the 
in clinical findings and patient symptoms and nerve conduction test. So here we can see it taken now. This followed now, we can see how it gets taken and hypoechoic at the level of fibular uh, tunnel. Again, this is a patient that will have foot drop following plaster cast removal for knee injury. And we can see a taken now, maybe some of the axons are also teared here. And we can see how it is getting thickened and encased in the fibrous tissue at the callus tissue at the level of the uh, fibular tunnel. This is the nerve here. This is a very nice case. Patient came with the symptoms of uh, common perineal nerve compression, and we have a very thin, long bony structure impinging into it. So uh, we did an X-ray, and we can see a uh, bony spur there from the tibia that is compressing the impinging into the common perineal nerve with a thick perineal nerve. We can see there, which is hypoechoic. Tarsal tunnel syndrome means that the uh, uh, post. The, this posterior tibial nerve get compressed at the level of tarsal tunnel, commonly by a osteophyte, as you can see here. And the osteophyte is impinging on the nerve very badly. Or there may be a ganglion cyst compressing the nerve there. <coughs> or uh, we have a uh, prominent substance column tele impinging on the medial plantar nerve. Even the superficial sensory nerve of common perineal nerve, branch of common perineal nerve may get compressed while it becomes superficial, piercing the deep fascia here. We can see a thickened nerve in comparison to the other side. This is a football player. He shows, uh, he came with a diffuse pain on the dorsum of the foot and the MRI was done and reported as normal. The patient came to the ultrasound and he, the area he shows this area over his ankle and he says it, whenever he touched it, it gave a diffuse sensation over his foot. And I just placed a probe there and I could see a bony projection that is impinging on the superficial perineal nerve. So I reviewed the MRIs study and see a small osteophyte at the, from the uh, TBL and, and that is causing the compression of the superficial perineal now. Whenever we have soldier muscle uh, weakness, there is a loss of external rotation uh, with, uh, with uh, atrophy of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle. Uh, and here is a cause. This is the paralabral cyst compressing the suprascapular now at the suprascapular notch level. So this and different uh, commonly uh, we get commonly common sites of nerve compression. Next, we'll move for the nerve subluxation and dislocation. Whenever we tell about nerve sub subluxation, it usually mean it's for the ulnar nerve because we know it's a very cutaneous structure lying in the cubital tunnel. And it has a tendency to move uh, anteriorly across the, uh, across the medial epicondyle um, in flexion. So it can be present in 16% of normal healthy individual and 47% of them remain asymptomatic. So here is the chicken nerve we can see there. And this is the nerve inside the tunnel on extension. We can see a lax, maybe disrupted osponate naculum there. And on flexion, we can see the nerve is moving out of the cubital tunnel and lying at the level of the medial epicondyle. If it is goes beyond then, then it will be termed as dislocated nerve. So here is the nerve going out of the tunnel, cubital fossa, and uh, it's followed by the head of the tricep. So it is dislocated out. So whenever there is ulnar subluxation, we ask the patient to uh, do dynamic study on flexion. And whenever he flex, his hand, it will go out of the cubital fossa across the tunnel, giving a sensation of a click. We can, uh, that we can palpate both the patient and the nerve. We can see it's going out with a click and coming back with a click there. If you can appreciate it, and this can be seen in a ulnar nerve subluxation. And sometimes what happened, the ulnar nerve is followed by the medial head of triceps, and it also gets subluxes it, will sublux it with it, and it gives two click there, and it is called snapping tricep syndrome. Just see, it's coming back on extension, and it's two with two click. For just notice it, you can see the clip going out one, 
as a second and coming back, first click, second click. This knob is already just dislocated. It's lying far away from the main electric handrail outside the origin of the common extension tunnel. So coming to nerve infections, there may be different infections that are like Hansen disease or nerve leprosy is again coming back. And there may be now because in the city very from mild to significantly hypoechoic followed by loss of fascicular pattern. There will, there will be increased vascularity. It involves multiple nerves, uh, including the ulnar nerve, and then median nerve, then great auricular nerve, and, uh, and other nerve like posterior tibial and common perineal nerve, et cetera. So we have a thickened nerve with thickened fascicles there and increased vascularity. And vascularity directly relate with the activity of the tissues. This is a very nice video showing um, high rich vascularity of the nerve that is, in, that is uh, infected by Hansen bacillus. So this case, the young man has an uncontrolled spontaneous facial spasm and he is undergoing Botox therapy for that. But the clinician noticed some swelling on the lateral aspect of the neck on both sides. So he asked for Doppler study to exclude uh, some thrombosis of the superficial vein. And see what I got there, I got the thickened greater auricular nerve on both sides. They are thickened with nodular swelling there on both sides. And uh, these are the uh, great auricular nerve as it turns along the posterior border of the uh, sternocleidomastoid and becomes superficial. And here we can follow the nerve in nodular taken in. It's turning around the posterior border and going inside deeper and similar here also. So we have also same finding in the um, transverse cervical nerve and facial nerve, and it was diagnosed as a case of Hansen disease of the peripheral neuropathy, causing peripheral neuropathy of great auricular nerve and facial nerve leading to the facial spasm. Another very uh, interesting case, the patient came with uh, hand pain, swelling, etc. We can see uh, some uh, evidence of fasciitis there with irregular subcutaneous plan. And this is a case of substance abuse. We used to take um, injection of uh, heroin and, and we can see some dots there and some linear echogenic structure that is a, that's possibly represents segment of hypodermic needles. And there, there was necrotizing fasciitis and myositis. There are multiple abscesses in the uh, flexor group of muscles. And we can see neuritis of the median and all enough. And this can happen when there is misfired of the injections into the muscle instead of the vein and uh, usually infectious in origin and causes so staphylococcus aureus infection there. This case came with tightening on uh, tightening of the sick. And I was confused what to see, but uh, I can see only some thickening of the masseter muscle. But suddenly, it, I'm surprised to see the rhythmic involuntary oscillatory repetitive movement of the masseter muscle as shown there. And it is a case of oromandibular dystonia, possibly secondary to neuritis. And we can demonstrate a motor branch uh, of the anterior mandibular nerve. Then coming to polyneuropathy. Polyneuropathy means there is involvement of multiple nerves like Hansen disease that was infective that commonly we got it in the case of diabetes followed by hypothyroidism. So the peripheral neuropathy diabetes is due to damage of the uh, it causes hyalination of the small vessels of the nerve that supplies the nerve and it leads to ischemia. So patient will uh, usually lose the sensory uh, function first so he um, used the food, leading loss of sensation, there will be injury ulceration ultimately lead to the die and diabetic food. So the feces is dead. There will be diffuse thickening of the nerve, including the fascicles, irrespective of the compression site. But we should remember these patients are more prone to have compression neuropathy because of its size. Now we'll move to the nerve injury. If we Understand our nerve structure, it becomes very easy for us to understand the sedans classification of nerve injury. So if we have the neuropraxia, that is damage of the myelin C talon, we have the, our axon intact, but loss of myelin C that needs to conduction defect. 
is actually all the um, compressive neuropathy are is really a type of neuropraxia with loss of myelin seed, most of them. And if the action and myelin seed is damaged, this is called action of masses. And if there is complete disruption of the nerve, then it is called neurotmesis. So here is a case of out plus palsy. We can see the typical poster of the hand. It's a one month old baby that had forced delivery. And we can see the swelling and uh, laceration of the sternocleidomastoid mastoid and anterior scalene muscle. And we have taken C5 and 6 now, now stair, root, now root stair. And this is the cause of our palsy. And on follow up scan, the now caliber decreases and patients slowly improved over six to seven months. In anterior dislocation of the soldier, we have neuropraxia of axillary nerve here. Here is a retail nerve injury. We say uh, it's 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 called by a fancy name that is the Saturday night palsy. After a very right, the patient used to fall asleep with the arms down over the cerebic or under the head, and it leads to the wrist um, drop in the morning. And we see a nerve fiber there, radial nerve there, which is thick, and, and there are some translucent areas gap between them. It possibly because of the tear of the actions. This is a very uh, difficult case for me. It's a 13 year old boy come with reduced fix, uh, fracture of tibia and fibula. It's already fixed. Then after next day he developed, there is claw, claw hand of the uh, patient. So I have to examine putting my probe on the raw skin between the, uh, between the processes. And ultimately, after trying for a long time, I find out a segment of the ulnar nerve that shows axonotmosis and it's taken between the second and third pin there. And it was surgically reopened and removed. In case, uh, it is a case of coracobrachialis injury. We know that uh, musculoskeletal nerve passes through it. It shows axonotmosis and taken in there. And we say the nerve is the line between the hematoma and uh, hematoma of the muscles. This is a 13 year old boy with history of fall. Six months back, it develops retail nerve palsy at re-stroke and uh, it, it was not treated. On ultrasound, we can see a supracondylar fracture there and there is a complete tear of the mid nerve uh, we can see here and uh, an intervening scars. So it was uh, treated surgically, it's open. You can see the gap between the middle, between the um, end of the radial nerve. Another case with parcel tear uh, of the ulnar nerve who has soft, a sharp injury at the cubital fossa. It's already subluxed and injury of the osponage nagulum is there. But uh, I feel that some fibers are intact on the anterior aspect and on surgery, it shows a, about 75% tear of the nerve with few fibers intact. This is a one and a half month old Glass cut injury of the distal forearm presenting with illness of the lateral three fingers. There is complete disruption of the nerve, as you can see, and intervening scar tissue. Uh, this is the gap between the nerve, and here is the scar injury. And we can uh, see here, it's, this is coming, the med, uh, med in now. Then it's intervening scar tissue. Again, it appears at the other end. Another case of neurotmesis with complete disruption occupied by a hematoma. Uh, we have to measure the gap and inform the clinician. Not only the gap, we have to measure the distance of the healthy, healthy nerve tissue because they have to uh, do the grafting. If they do the graft, grafting or end-to-end -end anastomosis, if possible, they will join the healthy end to the other healthy end. So we need to see the normal now uh, structure is present or not at the site of the cut tissue, cut area. And also we have to measure the caliber and uh, the vascularity, vascularity of the nerve. So never forget the neurovascular bundle on routine scanning or vice versa, whether it may be an exostosis, you just have to say where is the nerve uh, neurovascular bundle lying closer to it or it's impinged or not. Or maybe a foreign body with distal end lying close to the nerve and positive genial sign, the distance between them, or it may be a ulcer lying over the superficial, uh, superficial common perineal nerve. 
So we always had to uh, see the neurovascular bundle when we see a pathology or a pathology closer to a nerve when we see a nerve. Otherwise, you know what will happen. And the question will be, whose fault? Was my report adequate? So in cases, we, we can go for intervention also when there is uh, pathology compressing the nerve. So it's a um, better only. It's involving the deeper sub, uh, sub, uh, deeper part of the Baker cyst, uh, gastrocnemius, subgastrocnemius component. It's moving literally and kephalot and pressing over the arterial nerve here. So we used to, um, we can aspirate the cyst there uh, inter doing intervention. This is a case by Dr. Gaurav Soma. He's a well-known musculoskeletal radiologist. He shows how a median nerve can be dissected in case of perineal fibrosis with a hydro hydrolysis. He used to inject it first above, separating it from the uh, structure and slowly dissecting the fibers around it. Then it, it goes below the nerve and dissecting the fibers and injecting fluid there. And it increases the space for the median nerve and uh, decrease, it, it, it is almost equivalent to the surgical removal of the uh, fibrosis. And it is useful in case of post-operative fibrosis cases. So Mindre has given a very special technique that is a 4D magnetic GPS needle navigation technology that not only shows the, um, shows the uh, increased uh, needle industrially, enhanced the needle, and also detect the needle alignment and trajectory in real time. So it is it can be very useful for a new uh, radiologist who is interested in doing uh, interventions. So in conclusion, I would like to say that ultrasound is the preferable investigation, investigating modality for assessing the peripheral nerve, keeping in view of its easy availability, its dynamicity and flexibility. It can better delineate tiny fascicles and early nerve changes, 95 to 100% accurate in peripheral nerve injury detection and follow-up, it correlation with physical examination is highly helpful for diagnosis of localization and however, not always correlated with a nerve conduction test. And the disadvantage is that ultrasound is operator dependent. It needs a high frequency linear transducer for proper evaluation of the nerve and subtle changes in the surrounding tissue like denervation nerve edema or bone injury are difficult to um, bone in edema, actually, it's are difficult to differentiate or appreciate in MRI. So it was first reported in 1987, uh, now ultrasound, and so it's time to start. It was done by Fornes in 1987. So we have to start doing it now. And in this occasion, I always like to remember my Yukam family, the beautiful friends it gave to me, and my dedicated teachers who are still inspiring and supporting us. And the best example for this is Dr. Ankit. He's still sitting with me and supporting me from all sides. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, wow. I mean, Dr. Opasna, that was fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Ankit. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. This is a lovely session. Um, so we'll take up the question answers now. Yeah, yeah. If uh, any of you all have any que questions, please feel free to uh, ask and, you know, we'll try it and answer them as best as we can. So, so uh, this, yeah. Please yeah, in the Q&A, sir, there are two questions, if you can. Right. Uh, all right. So there's the first one, uh, which says that, how often does Morton's neuroma and intermetatarsal bursitis uh, coexist? How often do we see them together? Yeah, Dr. Upasana, you want to ask, answer you that? Can tell, you can tell you how much experience than me. <laughs> no. So uh, in the recent literature, a lot of them uh, uh, have said that, you know, Morton's neuroma and intermetatarsal bursitis often coexist together. In fact, there are a couple of good articles. One of them is from AJR. Uh, they say that almost from 7% to 22% of them 
uh, you know patients they have uh, together uh, you know intermetatarsal bursitis as well as morton's neuroma so both of them can coexist together so that is one you know a lot of times we do have this difficulty is it assist, uh, is it a morton's neuroma or is it an intermetatarsal bursa so how do you differentiate it so uh, maybe uh, just a rule of thumb or maybe you know if you want to say if you see that it's more likely to be cystic more uh, you know uh, a well defined think of a bursa if it's predominantly hypoechoic looks ill defined solid uh, think more of a morton's neuroma so yeah these are the things that you should see uh, you know uh, a lot of times they do say that uh, you have to demonstrate uh, the, the continuity of the lesion with the nerve but yes. uh, sometimes it may become a bit difficult you know especially if the uh, if the sole of the foot is really thick you might really not get that penetration so when you're looking yes. for morton's neuroma make sure that you drop your frequency so that you you are better uh, you know you will be able to visualize it much better yeah do you have anything else to add dr upasna to that It's okay. If I may, we can try the molded sign. I've described yeah. it already. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's uh, absolutely essential. So uh, the next question is: How useful is elastography to differentiate nerve edema versus fibrosis? Uh, okay. So uh, you know there are some good news and bad news. The good news is uh, uh, elastography has been extensively studied in median nerve because it's really superficial especially at the level of the wrist so we can uh, you know a lot of studies do say that you know the nerve becomes a bit more stiffer especially when they're using shear wave elastography uh, uh, but uh, the problem is you know it happens on the post operative scan you know when you want to look at it because a lot of times the patient will be referred to you at different stages after surgery you really don't know if that soft tissue is that fibrous tissue is a granulation tissue or not so that is one thing that you would really need to differentiate uh but uh, most of the times we do our imaging on b mode but yes there is a lot of promise but uh, still no real cut off yeah. values for uh, yes uh, for, for nerve stiffness so uh, there's one person who's asked for uh, can we how do we look for lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh so basically for that what we do is uh, dr opasna you want to go take that i think lateral no, cutaneous you can, you can see it where the um, inguinal ligament bifurcates and attaches to the anterior superior spine we will have the nerve there and that's all we can find it with high resolution probe easily It's not right. a very right. So uh, a lot of times, uh, maybe what you can do is you can put the lateral end of your probe over the anterior superior iliac spine, and your orientation of your probe should be parallel to the inguinal ligament. And then uh, you know you can trace it up and down, like how Dr. Opasna said, you use the elevator technique, and you move your probe in that plane. And most of the times you should be able to find the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. There are times when you might not be able Hello. Hello. I think we have lost sir's voice. Okay. Ma'am, you can continue the answer. Or best. Uh, yeah, you, sir, sir. On. Sir, yeah, we have sorry. Been, uh, for a few seconds. Can you yeah, repeat sorry. your answers? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, we have a lot of. Sir, no, we have lost you for a few seconds. Just repeat yeah. your answer. Your voice got yeah, lost. So. Uh, Okay, my voice got lost. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so basically, what happened is, uh, what happens is you put a lateral end of your probe over the anterior superior iliac spine, and your probe should be uh, parallel to the inguinal ligament. And once you do that, you move your probe up and. It's again lost. You should be able to see the anterior superior iliac, uh, sorry, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Uh, but then uh, there might be times when you might not be able to identify it because uh, uh, that nerve has a lot of uh, a lot of variations with res uh, with respect to its position. So yeah, so but most of the times it should be possible. Yeah. Any more questions? 
Yeah. So uh, one more thing, maybe I can ask Dr. Upasana, what all do you include in your report when you're reporting for carpal tunnel syndrome? Is there a checklist or is there something that you would always like to give in your report? Yeah, uh, we, we, whenever we are looking for a carpal tunnel, first I have said I used to do an extended study. We do a complete study. Uh, so we'll report the now proximal to the carpal tunnel at the level of carpal tunnel and also include the distal uh, nerve beyond the carpal tunnel, including its branches. If uh, what is the changes there, then uh, you know, what about the vascularity? Because vascularity signifies the chronicity of the disease and the prognosis. Then uh, if there is anything um, in the, anything extra structure within the canal that may cause some compression of the nerve, like it may be an accessory muscle or tendon, if there is any nerve uh, anomalies there, like uh, I have said that if there is bifid major nerve or persistent major nerve tree there, or any, anything like uh, if there is any tenosynovitis or arthritis or a ganglion cyst, that can cause the compression. And also uh, about the muscle atrophy, that is the clinically diagnosed sign, of course. Yeah, yeah I think, yeah, that pretty much sums up ev uh, everything. Uh, yeah, so you basically, that's the role of ultrasound. You have to look for any other secondary causes of carpal and, tunnel syndrome. And of course, okay, yeah. we have to do the dynamic study and always compare with the opposite side if it is normal and uh, and uh, clinically we could compare with the nerve conduction study to give or diagnose it as a uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. In fact, I, I personally feel that um, it I, we should see the nerve senses rather than the caliber of the nerve. It's the diameter of the nerve. The nerve senses we can see are more important. Okay, fine. So uh, there's one more question. Uh, so which is the commonest nerve pathology diagnosed by ultrasound, uh, wherein the nerve conduction studies may not help? So uh, I got many, many, many cases where nerve conduction study may not correlate, correlate with your finding, but patient has symptoms and we have nerve changes. So our neurologist took it as nerve compression, but I don't know if there's any particular nerve which is uh, usually enough conduction study is negative for that. Right. right. Yeah, I think, uh, so what, you have a point there. See, up till now, we always used to feel that nerve uh, lesions are functional. Uh, you know, when we do, uh, they were evaluated with functional studies like nerve conduction velocities and so on. But now, uh, what ultrasound is done, uh, does, or what imaging does is it add, adds an anatomical perspective to the uh, nerve lesion. So, uh, yeah. And you should know that the nerve conduction st uh, studies, they are always delayed. They at least take four to six weeks to develop. So by then, if you want to look at the status of the nerve or if there's anything else happening to the nerve, that's where ultrasound is really helpful. So, yeah. Yes, Dr. Rupsuti is saying, Rupsuti Hazirka is my neurologist. And yeah. in fact, he is uh, the first person to send me ultrasounds of the nerve insist me to do it. So um, he says we always combine with our nerve conduction study. Uh, he, he used to do it with the ultrasound report. Oh, wow. That, I mean, that's wonderful. That's very encouraging. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, there are no more questions. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add? It's a less explored area, Ankit. We have to have experience of uh, conducting uh, this type of ex examinations, and then only the questions will come to our mind. And we are still in a learning process of that, I think. Uh, right, right. So uh, one more thing I would like to add is, you know, one place where ultrasound really, really scores is, you know, in the post-operative setting, you know, in yeah. the presence of uh, metallic hardware, you know, the... Uh, fracture shaft of the humerus has been fixed and after that the patient has developed a wrist drop this is something people will experience uh, you know who are working in hospitals and uh, you know patient has come with a wrist drop now what now what uh, you know even the surgeon is uh, really concerned what's going on and that's where i think ultrasound is really really good you are able to trace the entire nerve right from the brachial plexus all the way down and yes. uh, yeah 
and it's very reassuring to the surgeon that when you tell them that yes the nerve is in continuity maybe there's a little bit of edema that little bit of intraneural edema they're not bothered about as long as the nerve is intact it is impinged with a surgical yeah. plate or and if you correlate with the clinical finding then you can exactly say where, where the nerve is got impinged so yes absolutely okay. yeah so, so i i think it's over yeah thank thank you all thank for you. joining thank you thank you dr rajiv and all the persons from mainry and dr ankit thank you again so much for coming and uh, supporting me right. today right. thank you right. thank you, you ma'am sandeep wants to say a few words for you Uh, just uh, give us two minutes yeah uh, thank you very much ma'am and dr ronki for this wonderful presentation and very informative session really we are amazed for, for this presentation thanks for giving a great insight to this very interesting subject uh, like your ultrasound evaluation of peripheral nerve uh, pathologies it's a really very interesting session i'm sure all the attendees will be looking forward your upcoming session uh, that's true thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, See you and meeting you soon, ma'am and sir. Be safe to all and stay healthy. Uh, before closing this, uh, just uh, this meeting, maybe I will remind to all recording of this session will also be put on the Mandra India page. So once again, thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank good you. Night, good night. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Bye, bye, Kosen. Thanks, Dr. Ron, ma'am. Then Sunday. Goodbye. Good bye ma'am. Thank you ma'am. Thank you. Thanks to Amrit also. Monoji yeah. goodbye. Yes. Goodbye. Yes. Yes. Bye. Thank you ma'am. Karva. How do we generate that?